What's up, Wisecrack? Helen here. We talk a lot about the choices made by screenwriters and directors, but there's one piece of the filmmaking process that film scholarship often underappreciates – acting. Today, we're going to zoom in on the interesting, inventive, and sometimes inexplicable choices that actors make, and the way those choices can define a character in our collective imagination. And we're doing so by looking at pop culture's most baffling character – your favorite diabolical clown, the Joker. Why so serious? So welcome to this Wisecrack edition, How to Portray the Joker. And not really any spoilers ahead. Unless you somehow weren't aware that the Joker is a criminal with a penchant for manic giggling. <laughs> so for our purposes, and with no disrespect to the vocal legend that is Mark Hamill, we're going to focus on the four and a half live-action cinematic portrayals of Gotham's most villainous clown. For some of this, we're going to look to the work of academic Dan Hassoon, who did a really smart comparison of Cesar Romero, Jack Nicholson, and Heath Ledger, while supplementing it with our own analysis and a look at Jared Leto and Joaquin Phoenix's interpretations of the role. Let's start with the delightfully cheesy 1966 performance by Cesar Romero, who also portrayed the character in the 1966 to 1968 television show. Romero's take on Joker fits squarely into the harmless circus clown camp. He's a giggly prankster who seems to be having a fantastic amount of fun. If you haven't seen the film, it's an interesting watch if only for marveling at just how much the character and the series has changed with the times. This version of Batman features corny moments like this. Hand me down the shark repellent bat spray. Fight sequences like this, and lines of dialogue like this. Holy Halloween! Fittingly for the campy tone, Romero imagines Joker as a cheerful criminal with a penchant for loud giggles and saying things like, I'll incapacitate the beast with my trick confetti. His over the topness skews somewhat Marx Brothersy, even. Romero's portrayal of the Joker fit his acting strengths as well as the broader cinematic approach taken when making this spectacularly weird Batman debut film. So, what choices make Romero's Joker his own? Let's start with Romero's background. He grew up as a dancer in nightclubs and musical theater, where he was used to employing his entire physicality. As an actor, he became best known for his appearances in musical comedies and romances, making his comedic portrayal of the clown quite fitting. There's almost a mock Shakespearean read, theatrical element to Romero's performance. His arms are perpetually thrust out, and he trills his R's. Of course, you will keep going forever. Why, we will circle the earth a few more times to give everyone a good look at my saucer as they await my ultimate ultimatum in fear and trembling before I return, ruler of the universe! Which is an old theater trick for projecting one's words clearly to the audience. Each movement is injected with a hint of the surreal. Instead of walking, he seems to frolic. Instead of staring, he bugs his eyes out like an overacting silent film star. His laugh was never menacing, merely reveling in his own depravity. <laughs> what a deliciously humorous trajectory! While suited to his strengths as an actor, Romero's style also fit filmmaking conventions of the time, particularly in the way they were employed in this film. Hassoon notes that the way Romero was shot in this film is perhaps best communicated by the opening image of him, a long shot in which he gestures wildly with a bouquet of fake flowers before running, along with the camera pan, toward his crew of evildoers. The camera proceeds to remain in wide to medium-wide shots for the rest of the scene. Such a setup was common for the Batman television show and indeed for many shows at the time because it didn't require any major lighting changes, which was a notoriously cumbersome task when shooting on film. What's more, the low contrast lighting scheme and reliance on bright colors and high saturation means that there's nowhere to hide, no part of Romero's body that isn't visible. Importantly, the movie has a high average shot length, with this scene averaging in at a whopping 10.81 seconds per shot. That makes it virtually impossible for Romero, or any character, to remain too static for too long. And lastly, we can't talk about this performance without mentioning this. Romero refused to shave his iconic mustache for the role, saying that he would rather lose the part entirely than lose his upper lip fuzz. Particularly once the TV show was digitally remastered, this resulted in an especially unbecoming and unintimidating look long before Henry Cavill's Stashgate. Compare Romero's clownish antics to the slicker performance of Jack Nicholson in the 1989 Tim Burton Batman, which watches the character descend from a not-very-nice mob boss to a positively diabolical clown who defaces art museums and poisons deodorant. Nicholson's performance comes with a perpetual eyebrow raise, like he's in on the joke, and is creepy but funny, which keeps it from fully passing over into terrifying. It's somewhere in between the campiness of Romero and the depravity of Heath Ledger's performance. Nicholson is true to the cartoon character, and he even co-wrote the Joker's dialogue. The resulting performance transformed the character for a grimmer time and a more sinister Gotham metropolis. 
Hsu notes that the way Nicholson portrays the Joker also correlates pretty closely to the tradition of acting that he grew up in. Nicholson honed his craft in a Hollywood crossroads during the 1950s. It was the death of the tightly controlled studio system and the rise of method acting. As a result, Nicholson is a somewhat transitional figure from old to new Hollywood. While old Hollywood dictated their actors' brands, encouraging them to take on similar roles to bolster that brand, the new philosophy of method acting had actors becoming immersed in different pseudo-personalities. Method acting asked actors to dig deep into their own emotions to find their character, sometimes through improvising. In the role of Joker, as in many of his roles, Nicholson embodied the contradictions of the Jack Nicholson persona. That is to say, on the one hand, he melds the old form of personality acting in which actors became firmly associated with the character type they played. That is, you're watching not just the Joker, but Nicholson himself and his wild, smack-talking bad boy brand. On the other hand, he injects the new methods of improvisation that gave his character a wildly unpredictable air. He might in the same second laugh or dance like a crazy bird. What's more, Nicholson was clearly having fun. He literally told other actors on set not to take the comic book too seriously, and rather to let the wardrobe do the acting. While this is obviously an overstatement, Nicholson was doing plenty of acting in every single frame, it still expresses the fact that he saw the role as one of theatricality. Only unlike Romero's lighter version, Nicholson's was a darker, slyer, firmly sarcastic theatrical portrayal of Joker. Then there's the cinematography. Unlike Romero, Nicholson is filmed primarily in single character, medium, or medium close shots, which led Hassoum to describe his performance as more oriented around the upper torso. The framing of the shot limits Nicholson's movements. Even his dramatic or energetic arm motions have to be tightly controlled to remain in shot. As a result, Hassoum describes his performance as relatively still in comparison to Romero's playful antics. This all means that Nicholson's performance exists largely in his face and arm movements. The importance of his face is even telegraphed to us in the film, which takes great pains to very, very dramatically reveal the Joker's transformed countenance. As he steps into the light, the camera zooms in to a low-angle close-up. What's more, the moody, dark, and high-contrast lighting scheme means that aspects of the frame are less visible. As a result, Nicholson's face full of white makeup stands out, making it the true center of his character. This face-centric framing and performance would be further accentuated in arguably the most iconic Joker performance of all time, Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight. The actor played the character with a new, deadly seriousness and an almost reptilian air of psychotic evil. His tongue was always flicking, his brows always writhing, his eyes perpetually darting around. This was the darkest version of the Joker we'd seen yet, and many would say the very best one. How did Ledger pull this off? While immensely talented, he was unschooled as an actor, saying in interviews that he relied largely on instinct and impulse to guide his performances. Though not a method actor in the scholastic way of Nicholson, Ledger notoriously disappeared into the role of Joker, isolating himself in his apartment where he journaled for hours as the character, filling a notebook with disturbing writing and imagery to conjure the character. As Hassoun puts it, Romero, Nicholson, and Ledger show Hollywood's evolution in acting from star personality to improvisation to impersonation. That is, actors in the modern era are expected not only to find the character through emotional introspection, as method actors did, but to actively inhabit the entire world of their character, which is often signified by the actor undergoing major physical transformations for each role. While Ledger's Joker character is, at moments, funny to behold, it's clear that Ledger approached the role with utter seriousness. You couldn't, for instance, imagine him telling his co-stars to let the wardrobe do the talking, even in jest. But Ledger's performance is also pretty firmly cemented in its own cinematic era. Whereas an actor like Romero had luxuriously lengthy shots to clown around in, the average shot rate plummeted from 11 seconds between 1930 and 1960 to just a few seconds by the early 2000s. Film theorist David Bordwell argues that this is symptomatic of the intensified continuity that the film industry has undergone, which tends to lead to faster-paced edits, perpetual camera movement, and increasingly zoomed-in shots. Ledger had to convey entire emotional journeys in mere seconds. The fact that his performance was so salient shows just how effective he was at doing so. Recall the 1966 Batman for a second. As we saw there, film and TV studios once relied primarily on the strength of a master shot which captures an entire scene in one wide frame, allowing all the action to take place within it. Think of this as the camera frame acting like a theater stage. For variety or emphasis, directors would cut to closer shots of objects or characters. But for the most part, actors were shown from the waist or knees up, 
often in shots with multiple characters. But in recent decades, the tight single shot has become king, with close-ups comprising ever more time in most films. As Boardwell puts it, mouths, brows, and eyes become the principal sources of information and emotion, and actors must scale their performances across varying degrees of intimate framings. This is clearly demonstrated when the Joker is first revealed in The Dark Knight, with a close shot that slices off his forehead and chin and still chills you to the bone. As teased by this shot, Ledger's Joker will exist primarily as a face, an incredibly, meticulously controlled face, one where the slightest twitch of an eye, or redirecting of an eyeball, or raise of a brow, or flick of the tongue can do more than most actors could do with their entire body. Ledger brought all the tortured gradations of the Joker to just beneath the surface, variously revealing the character's pain, torment, paranoia, anger, and glee. Also critical to the characterization is the octave-shifting ventriloquist-inspired voice that gives the character a hint of unpredictability and instability. To them, you're just a freak. Like me. They need you right now. But when they don't, they'll cast you out. The fluctuations of his voice and face lend the Joker character more complexity than he'd previously been afforded. After Ledger's passing and posthumous Oscar, the future of the Joker was cemented as a dark force of nihilism. All of which brings us to Jared Leto. Because we don't like harping on negatives or beating a dead cultural horse, we're gonna breeze right through his Suicide Squad performance, which is both underwhelmingly and blessedly brief. Leto's Joker was all gold-toothed psychopath, full of crazy eyes and large over-the-top movements, almost a high school play version of the character. Leto's turn as the Joker was much hyped and also very much disliked by the majority of critics and audiences. There are plenty of scathing takes on his performance, from the New Yorker calling his portrayal of evil roughly as frightening as Goodnight Moon, to Vice calling it comically campy, like a suburban Hot Topic manager's idea of edginess. I am not someone who is loved. I'm an idea. What makes the performance even more painful is that Leto so clearly seems to be attempting to resurrect Ledger's performance, as indicated by his dialed-up immersion in the role, which involved sending dead pigs and used condoms to other actors. This amounted to plenty of press attention and flash, but made for a frustratingly one-note performance without a hint of the nuance that colored Ledger's take on the character. In the same vein, Leto's Joker is weirdly flashy and gaudy in an entirely predictable way. Basically, Leto's performance turned the deadly serious preparation Ledger went through into mere fodder for film marketing. The suffering, misery, and craziness associated with getting into character as a performance usurps the performance itself. Also, that laugh. Ah. Ah. Yikes. So let's move on to last year, where we reached peak Joker with the release of, um, Joker. Starring Joaquin Phoenix, the film promised audiences a good two hours of uber darkness this time largely without the do-gooder interference of Bruce Wayne. Phoenix's Arthur Fleck was unique in his vulnerability. He was soft-spoken and clearly tormented. Yet the character had a seething anger that seemed to radiate and eventually overwhelm him. Watching him evolve from a beaten down clown plagued by his inability to stop laughing to a gun-toting killer who cackles merrily at his victim's death makes for arguably the most haunting performance of the year. Now, Phoenix had a luxury never before afforded to an actor playing the Joker. Because the movie was less a typical comic book film than a character study of a person's descent into a raging nihilistic psychopath, there was a lot of room for Phoenix to show off his acting chops, and then some. Determined not to refer to past renditions of the character, Phoenix, like Ledger, immersed himself in journaling while also rapidly shedding around 50 pounds, enough weight as to, in the actor's own words, start to go mad. As a known improviser, Phoenix is particularly rich to discuss when it comes to choices. The director and crew have discussed the way Phoenix's spontaneous experimentation was central to the way they shot the film. From choosing to empty out the fridge and crawl inside, as if signifying the character's desire to disappear, to this iconic scene after committing his first murders, in which Phoenix began spontaneously dancing in the bathroom. His performance, according to New York Times dance critic Gia Corliss, essentially placed two characters within one dancing body, showcasing the dichotomy of Arthur with the emerging Joker character that will slowly take over. Dance is, from the first time he grooves in front of his TV while holding a gun, as Corliss puts it, his path to bravery, something he's never known. As Arthur recedes and the Joker takes over, the choreography becomes more drawn out. He presents himself in a sort of power pose, as if by claiming space, he's claiming his identity, demanding to be seen, a topic we discuss in more detail in our video on Joker and the politics of recognition. 
This is also afforded by Todd Phillips' more experimental vision for the film, which spends lengthy moments focused on Phoenix's captivating physicality, zoning in on the way his muscles writhe and contort, as if to match his troubled soul. Then, of course, there's the laugh, which had previously ranged from goofy to diabolical. Phoenix's version, instead, is painful and gut-wrenching. <laughs> <laughs> his entire sinewy body convulses, his mouth stretches open against his will, his laugh forced out from his gut, all while his eyes show incredible suffering. He transforms the iconic laugh into a howl of pain. Phoenix's performance purposefully elicited audience empathy, and even perhaps pity. We feel for him, it's impossible not to, and that was absolutely necessary to the themes of the film. If Ledger gave the Joker depth, Phoenix forces us to emote with him. This rendition of the Joker would have been unimaginable in the late 60s, when the Joker was a simple, skin-deep villain. Phoenix transforms the Joker into a consummate anti-hero, someone you can feel with, even as you're horrified by him. What do you get I don't think so. when you cross I think a mentally ill loner with a it. society that abandons him and treats him like trash? Call the police, I'll man. tell you what you get! Call the police! You get what you fuck! There's something fitting about the unreliable trajectory of the Joker. For a villain famously without a backstory, it makes sense that he doesn't have a consistent characterization. What do we got? Nothing. No matches on prints, DNA, dental, clothing is custom, no labels. Nothing in his pockets but knives and lint. No name. No other alias. And it makes each new rendition of the character exciting. While other characters tend to thrive on their sheer predictability, you'll never have a clumsy, tongue-tied James Bond, for example. The Joker is so fascinating for the endless facets and gradations that talented actors have been able to uncover. But what do you guys think? What makes a good Joker performance? And who, if anyone, was the defining clown prince? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks again to our incredible patrons for supporting our podcast and channel. Go ahead and click that subscribe button. And before you go, I want to give a quick shout out to Upstart. See why Upstart is ranked number one over 300 other businesses on Trustpilot. And go to upstart.com slash wisecrack to find out your personalized rate today. Thanks for watching, guys. Peace.